good evening all and a very warm welcome to this uh, online platform and we are gathered here today for the third installment of the online lecture series uh, which was uh, last initiated on 13th of July 2023 and it was uh, started to commemorate the foundation day of the Physiological Society of India. So this online series uh, was organized by the Education Committee of Physiological Society of India. And uh, this uh, online education committee targets to cater to the curricular needs of both the undergraduate and the postgraduate students who are pursuing physiology at the MBBS course or the BDS course or just a simply major in human physiology. So today at the third lecture series, uh, the theme has been set to be of respiratory physiology and the honorable speakers uh, for today is Dr. Orich Chakraborty and Dr. Ishita Shaha. So the first lecture of this session will be on fundamentals of respiratory physiology. And we have with us uh, Dr. Orijit Chakraborty with us. And uh, a warm welcome, Orijit. And uh, the Dr. Orijit Chakraborty is uh, currently an, uh, working as an assistant professor in physiology department of sports physiology and nutrition national sports university which is a central university and it is under the ministry of youth affairs and sports uh, government of india and it's uh, located in infal manipur so uh, doctor a brief on doctor origi chakraborty uh, he is a student of physiology at both undergraduate and postgraduate he did his phd from uh, Department of Physiology, Calcutta University. He has been nominated as a, a rather uh, Origit. Dr. Origit has been confirmed as the founder fellow of the Physiological Society of India, that's FPSI, in the year 2021-22. He was nominated and selected as the executive committee member of the Physiological Society of India, and he served for the period of 2016 to 2019. He, uh, Dr. Origit has been an extraordinary student receiving gold medals at both the undergraduate and postgraduate curriculum and he received several prestigious research awards from the Physiological Society of India and uh, he also received uh, postdoc fellowship awards from both DST and UGC but currently his laboratory focuses on current cutting edge research on sports physiology with the emphasis on sports endocrinology and metabolism working mainly on genomics of sports performance and sports biology it's uh, indeed a very new topic on which Origit is working now. And uh, Dr. Chakraborty has published many research articles in both uh, national and international journals. And he has been editors, and uh, he has been the chief editor of Indian Journal of Life Sciences. And he is also the member of different uh, editorial board member of different reputed international journals. And he has a very uh, outstanding achievement recently where he has earned a grant of rupees 1.74 crores being the principal investigator from Indian Council of uh, Medical Research. And uh, his topic of research in that project is in the field of sports injury and its prevention, where he is the principal investigator. I wish him a very good luck in pursuing his project, which is a, indeed a new area, new arena. 
And with this brief uh, introduction, I would uh, just uh, uh, ask uh, Dr. Origi Chakraborty to begin his lecture presentation today. A warm welcome, Origi, and over to you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, madam, uh, for your kind time in introducing me. Uh, first of all, uh, I am. I think I am audible. Hello. Uh, audible. Okay. Thank you so much. So, first of all, I would like to express my uh, heartiest gratitude and sincere thanks to the Physiological Society of India. I am very closely associated with it. I was, and I am now also. And also a sincere thanks to the organizing secretary uh, and organizing committee of the PSI online lecture series for having me here. So I'd like to present my screen before I really go into it. Uh, I'm sure uh, the audience can uh, see my screen now. A line of confirmation is solicited. Yes, screen's visible. Uh, is it visible? Yes, your screen is visible. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, once again, uh, my heartfelt thanks to all uh, those who have come here. I have been told that uh, the uh, audience will be basically from undergraduate curriculum. So, I have uh, framed the contents of this lecture in such a way that it would be of great help to those undergraduate students, those who are a part of the physiology curriculum. So, let's begin uh, our journey to the fundamentals of respiratory physiology. Uh, firstly, the human respiratory system is a series of organs uh, that is responsible for taking in uh, oxygen and expelling out carbon dioxide, basically exchange of gases. And this exchange of gases uh, takes place within the lungs in the very part of the alveoli, more specifically saying. And uh, it, uh, it not only does the exchange of gases, but also it filters inspired air. It has a very high regulation in controlling blood pH. It also provides hum humidification to the inspired air. But having said all those, it, respons it is mainly responsible for taking in oxygen and expelling out carbon dioxide. That is the main, uh, one of the main function of the respiratory system. So before we really go into the deep of the respiratory system, we should know that what are the basic organs that are uh, associated with the respiratory system. Starting on, we start with the uh, external nostrils or nares. Then we have the nasal cavity following it. And uh, the nasal cavity then ends with the pharynx. We have uh, the larynx after the pharynx, and this larynx is the junction point between the trachea and the upper respiratory system. The trachea is the windpipe, which is uh, a long, slender, cylindrical hollow tube, and it extends uh, and divides and redivides into uh, bronchi. And this uh, primary bronchi that inserts into the lung and ultimately they ends in the form of alveoli. So, in the right hand side of the picture, I think you are very much clear that how and what is the you know distribution and gross anatomy of the human respiratory system moving on to the anatomy of the nasal cavity which is very important because nasal cavity have certain projections which are called conchi which are also in some books called as turbinate as you can see in the right hand side of the picture these conchi are uh, basically responsible for increasing the surface area uh, definitely uh, it has a very important role in increasing the air turbulence which is within the nasal, ca uh, uh, nasal cavity. The reason for uh, its uh, air turbulence is because when air turbulence occurs, the in inspired air that might contain a lot of pollutants as dust particles, they are thrown to the walls of the conchi, and the walls of the conchi, they contain a very uh, uh, sticky substances called the mucus, and this mucus love to you know uh, stick to those uh, uh, dust particles, and thereby resulting in the free-flowing air, which is more or less dust-free, to the later part of the respiratory system, right? The nasal cavity is separated from the oral cavity by the palate. And as you can see in the picture, uh, palate are of uh, two types. The anterior one is the hard one that is made up of the bone and the posterior is the soft one that is made up of muscle, right? 
So going uh, more depth, we have the pharynx, which is also called the throat. It is a muscular passage uh, from the nasal cavity and extends up to the larynx. There are three distinctive regions in the pharynx, which are number one, nasopharynx. This is the superior region behind the nasal cavity. Then we have the oropharynx, which is the middle region behind the mouth. The mouth also extends up to the pharynx, which is called the oropharynx. Then we have the laryngeopharynx, which is the inferior region at, attached to the larynx, right? So the oropharynx and the laryngeopharynx, these are the common passageways for the air and food. So these, uh, through this passage, we can, uh, you know, uh, the air and food both can pass. And that is why these are uh, called as common passageways for food and air, right? Moving on, we have the trachea that is called the windpipe. And it connects the larynx with the bronchi. It is lined with the ciliated mucosa. I hope everyone knows about ciliated mucosa. And uh, these mucosa, they beat continuously in the opposite direction of incoming air, thereby they are having a filtration effect. And not only that, it expels the mucus loaded with dust and other debris away from the lungs. So all those uh, mechanisms and phenomena, they uh, result in the purification of the inspired air, thereby uh, the air free from any dust particles or any other, uh, mostly other foreign organism, they may be freed of and they may be transported into the lower part of the respiratory tract. A very important thing to note is that the walls of the trachea and windpipe, they are reinforced with C-shaped hyaline cartilage, which provides stability, rigidity, and also some portion of flexibility to the trachea, so that, uh, you know, uh, there is a very important and uh, uh, uninterrupted uh, flow of air or an exchange of gases can, uh, can take place within the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory one, right? It's, it's for the C-shaped hyaline cartilage. That's a very important point to remember. Next, going to the primary bronchi, it is formed by the division of trachea. As you can see here, the trachea primarily divides into or bifurcates into two, and these are called the primary bronchi. And it enters the lung, as you can see in the right hand side, it enters the lung at a specific point. This is called the hilus, which is also called the medial depression. And if you consider and you compare the anatomy between the two uh, uh, primary bronchus, then you will find the right bronchus is wider, a bit shorter and straighter than the left one. That is the main possible reason why that uh, whenever whatever contaminants that are entering uh, through the external nostril into the latter part of the respiratory tract, most of these contaminants are first concentrated in the right part of the lung because of this anatomical uh, you know peculiarity. And the bronchi, as you can see, this divide and subdivide into smaller and finer bunches and ultimately end with the alveoli. So it has been seen that. Uh, as many as 23 uh, different types of branches they are having and ultimately, as I said, the ends into alveoli, which are exactly the areas of gaseous exchange. So coming to the uh, biggest organ of the respiratory system, this is the lungs that occupy the mostly and the most of the thoracic cavity, as you can see. If you consider the anatomy of the lung, then it, you, you can see that the apex or the trip portion of the lung is situated at the clavicle, which is a superior portion also. The best rest, uh, the base of the lungs rest on the diaphragm. That is very important in mechanics of breathing, which is also called the inferior portion. And if you closely look at the uh, structure of the lung, then you will find that each of the lung has been divided into different lobes. The left one has got two lobes and the right one has got three. The interesting point to note that why the left has got one lobe less because to accommodate the heart, which is slightly tilted towards the left hand side. So this is the reason why the left side of the lung is having two lobes. Right. So this is the pictorial uh, demonstration of the lungs uh, and also its associated structure. In these beautiful pictures, you can see that uh, all the posterior and anterior side along with the position of the lips, ribs and the most important parts, esophagus, root of lungs, hilus, pulmonary trunk, all those organs are given in a single picture. You can find the anatomical positions of all those important organs here. And also you can find how the thoracic cavity is assembled. Once it is done, then you can see how the structures they accommodate and the heart is placed between the two lungs. And also you can see the branches of the primary uh, leading to secondary tertiary and so on bronchi. And also you can see how the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein, including the sternum is situated. So this picture is self-explanatory. And you can see that seeing the picture, you can get an idea how anatomically your lungs and associated organs are there in the pleural cavity right so uh, this is an uh, you know picture of bronchioles and uh, these bronchioles are uh, the terminal bronchioles end in the alveoli this uh, you can see if you see very closely the highlighted picture which is given here it is giving a clear indication how 
you know the uh, uh, gases specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide has been uh, have been exchanged and uh, the side of the exchange is the terminal alveoli which is nothing but uh, these alveolar sacs or alveoli are nothing but these are uh, you know uh, uh, balloon shaped uh, sacs they they inflate and deflate depending on air in coming in and coming out and these are specifically the areas where you know exchange of these gases takes place which is broadly called as the respiratory zone as you find here more or less the uh, diagram is the same but uh, these structures are in total clustered as respiratory zone because in these are the structures where you know absolute site of these are the uh, uh, areas where uh, site of gas exchange happens and these structures include respiratory bronchiole alveolar duct and alveoli so as you can see in the right hand side of the picture all those nomenclatures are given and actually uh, these areas are the areas where uh, you know the gaseous exchange that is exchange of oxygen and exchange of carbon dioxide takes place and uh, which can be depicted in the areas which is highlighted right so moving on uh, this is a very important part and we are slowly moving towards the physiology of the respiratory system more from anatomical structures first part is the respiratory membrane uh, you should be very much uh, you know uh, knowing that there are different kinds of barriers that are present in the physiology of the human being uh, you must have heard about blood brain barrier blood testicular barrier so similar kind of barrier that is called air blood barrier is present in the respiratory membrane and if you closely look at the picture that is given here you will find that there are uh, you know these are the alveoli which are fluid filled uh, i mean uh, which are gas filled there it is these are the sites of gas exchange and if you very closely look at the picture then you will you will find that there are a lot amount of rbc or red blood cells are there because you know uh, red blood cells are uh, you know one of the uh, extreme positions where oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange takes place not only you will find rbc but you will also find a layer of squamous epithelial cell which are uh, lining the alveolar wall in addition to that you will you will occasionally find the surfactant secreting cell very important because surfactant like lecithin uh, these are secreted and that are very important for lowering the surface tension because you have an air to water interface in the in the alveoli and if the surface tension is not lowered by this surfactant then your alveoli has a chance to be crushed down and uh, definitely uh, you can see the most important part of this area is the respiratory membrane which consists of the alveolar epithelium you, it consists of the fused base vein membrane and also the capillary endothelium so these are the areas where you can see in the right hand side of the picture where it is magnified the oxygen is been taken in to the rbc from the lungs or the alveoli and the carbon dioxide from the plasma and from the RBC is being thrown into the alveolus for exchange of gases. So this is the area where actually in uh, you know in a very very in depth way if you, if you can see the exchange of gases takes place, right? So primarily we are moving towards the events of respiration now. So what are those? These are pulmonary ventilation that is moving of air in and out of the lungs, and we have the external respiration that is gaseous exchange between the pulmonary blood and the alveoli, right? So what is pulmonary ventilation? It has got two phases basically. What is inspiration? That is flow of air into the lungs and expiration that is air leaving the lungs. So basically in this self uh, diagrammatic picture, you will find that how the lungs is being taken in uh, air and how the oxygen rich uh, uh, you know, uh, air is being expelled out. And in the right hand side, you will also find that what are the minute areas like uh, capillary beds, uh, the pulmonary capillary beds where actually the exchange is taking place and the carbon dioxide being expelled out and oxygen is been taken in and uh, you know rbc loaded with uh, uh, you know oxygen is been taken to the uh, left side of the heart and from there it is efficiently and faithfully transmitted to the all over parts of your body right so this is a very self explanatory picture so in addition to that uh, we do experience some non respiratory air movements in our day to day life this can be caused by uh, you know reflexes or voluntary actions some of the examples include cough and sneeze uh, these are a very effective way to clear the lungs of debris and also we can see when we are laughing when we are crying these are some of the emotional states where we can see a change in uh, intake and exchange of air takes place uh, in the upper respiratory tract in addition to that we are very much familiar with these two uh, important events that is yawn and hiccup, hiccups in those situations also we do take a lot of air and also we uh, you know uh, have a change in uh, the usual intake of air pattern is changed and uh, there are a lot of theories about that but i'm not going into deep of that because this is not our primary area so these are some of the 
non respiratory air movements uh, that we experience in our day to day life right so uh, basically we are now going into the deep of physiology this is the gas transport uh, in the blood basically when you uh, talk about gas transport then we have to talk about oxygen and we have to talk about carbon dioxide so first come the oxygen and when you talk about oxygen the first thing that comes to our mind is hemoglobin right so hemoglobin is a very very special substance it is present within the rbc and you can see here there uh, the st chemical structure of hemoglobin is being given both at the left and the right side in the slide and you can the important thing to note is the four heme groups that are highlighted in green color you can see these are the areas where actually oxygen molecular oxygen they bind and uh, these if you notice very clearly then there are four areas which can bind with the oxygen or there are four heme groups which can bind with the oxygen so a complete hemoglobin one complete hemoglobin molecule can bind with four molecules of oxygen and if they does so then we will call it as 100% saturated okay and if uh, three arms of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen then we will call it 75 if 250 and so on and so forth right so these are uh, the areas i i mean this is the chemical structure uh, 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 through which hemoglobin transport mainly transport the gas or mainly transport the oxygen to be very precise right so once you talk about how uh, how the oxygen is transport uh, transported we have to talk about uh, you know what is really the mechanism by which oxygen is being transported by hemoglobin oxygen is being transported by hemoglobin in two different forms i mean uh, uh, one is the physically dissolved in the plasma one part is a very small part and you can see here that at 37 degrees celsius which is the internal core temperature of our human body uh, normal arterial blood contains 0.3 ml of oxygen per 100 ml of blood, right? It's a very small quantity. Then what is the major chunk of oxygen that is uh, taken by hemoglobin is by chemically combining it to the hemoglobin that is called oxyhemoglobin, right? So here we have got an uh, equation that is one gram of hemoglobin maximally can uh, bind with 1.34 ml of oxygen if it is 100% saturated or fully saturated. Now, a normal person can have maximum of 15 gram of hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood. And if that person has or if that person has so, then what is the amount of oxygen that person can carry? That will be equal to 1.34 into 15. That will be more or less equal to 20.1 ml, right? So, 20.1 ml of oxygen per 100 ml of blood is carried by hemoglobin as oxyhemoglobin. And 0.3 ml of oxygen per 100 ml of blood is carried by the physical solution in the plasma this has this has to be very clear in your mind right this picture uh, depicts the oxygen hemoglobin saturation curve and my experience with the uh, with the students is that uh, most of the students they don't understand this curve but it is very easy to understand that is why i keep this curve intentionally because uh, this uh, this you know hemoglobin is a very special molecule right it uh, you know behaves differently at the level of lungs and it behaves differently at the level of tissues in the lungs uh, you know at the level of lungs hemoglobin is a great associator i mean it loves to associate with oxygen but the same hemoglobin when it is coming via the circulation into the level of tissues it uh, uh, you know the phenomenon changes and it becomes a great dissociator dissociator means it loves to dissociate oxygen and when you dissociate oxygen, this oxygen faithfully is transmitted to the tissues. And all of we know that tissues love to take oxygen because they are in constant demand for that. Right? So, so naturally, when you plot hemoglobin saturation with the partial pressure of oxygen, then definitely you don't get a linear curve. You get a special curve, which is called a sigmoidal curve. Right? So what is the meaning of the sigmoidal curve? That I will uh, explain it to you very uh, minutely. So uh, we all know that at the level of lungs, lungs are having a lot of oxygen and there, therefore lungs are having increased or higher partial pressure of oxygen and that partial pressure of oxygen is 100 millimeter of mercury. That means the partial pressure of oxygen at the level of lungs is 100 millimeter of mercury. So let us understand or let us see that at this uh, point, this is 100 millimeter, 100 millimeter of mercury. At this point in the level of lungs, what is the saturation percentage of hemoglobin or how many arms of hemoglobin are loaded with oxygen? Here you can see if you extrapolate it, it will be nearly 100%. So at 100 millimeter of mercury, at partial pressure of 100 millimeter of mercury, at nearly 100% saturation of hemoglobin, you will find that what is the content of hemoglobin that is actually being carried by 
100 ml of blood it is nearly you will find that it will be 20 ml right so 20 ml is the total amount of oxygen carried by the hemoglobin per 100 ml of blood what at the level of lungs where you are getting partial pressure of oxygen of about 100 millimeter of mercury and what is the saturation percentage of hemoglobin four arms of hemoglobin are saturated with oxygen that is hemoglobin is 100 percent saturated right so this is scenario number one now what happens this 100 percent saturated hemoglobin or 20 ml per 100 uh, ml of blood hemoglobin it via the circulation comes at the level of tissues so what happens at the level of tissues tissues are having less partial pressure of oxygen because tissues are constantly using oxygen for their personal use right so the partial pressure of oxygen drops down from 100 to 40 millimeter millimeter of mercury at the level of tissues now when the partial pressure drop, drops down at 40 millimeter of mercury what is the percentage saturation of hemoglobin you will find it is about 75 percent then what is the meaning of this the meaning of this is hemoglobin from 100 percent has uh, been trans transformed into 75 percent that means 25 percent oxygen it has given to the tissues are you getting my point so 20 percent oxygen uh, uh, it, 25 percent oxygen is given to the tissues and if you talk about content of oxygen then the content of oxygen at tissue level when hemoglobin has completed its oxygen uh, giving capacity it what is the amount of oxygen that is left in the hemoglobin it is about 15 ml so if we see that what actually is the amount of oxygen that has been delivered by 100 ml uh, of blood you will find that 20 minus 15 that is 5 ml of oxygen that is being delivered by hemoglobin in a 100 ml of blood so that is very important to understand so you will find that this uh, you know situation uh, this situation of drop in partial pressure at the level of tissues leads to release in oxygen content of about 25 percent in the hemoglobin concentration which leads to 25 percent delivery to the tissues right we'll now see uh, one more intervention for this intervention is that this is the normal uh, you know respiratory i mean oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve that we have seen but there are some factors when actually for example when uh, we do exercise naturally when we do exercise and when we do, do training or when we play sports what the oxygen demand in our tissues is highly increased right so naturally uh, you know hemoglobin is so clever that it will now deliver more oxygen to the tissues naturally because oxygen is in need of uh, high uh, um, i mean the tissues are in need of high oxygen demand because we are doing some extra activities such as jogging or something like that what are those factors the factors are increase in partial pressure of car carbon dioxide if uh, you know understand the situation that whenever we are doing an, a particular activity or exercise not only we are increasing the demand for oxygen but also we are producing more carbon dioxide because all the tissues are working you know two times three times four times than its usual one so increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide also you know shift this curve which was normally sigmoid to the right hand side i mean if you shift the curve to the right hand side hemoglobin becomes even more good dissociator of oxygen what is what basically it does it it dissociates more and more oxygen to the tissues and that is very beneficial especially when the tissues have higher oxygen demand not only that when you do exercise there are a lot of you know metabolites that are being produced some are lactic acid and some other uh, types of acids that are being produced and we go into the state of metabolic acidosis and if you do strenuous exercise then what happens is that we also cause a decrease in blood ph so blood ph along with increase in partial pressure of carbon dioxide also influences the hemoglobin to dissociate more oxygen to the tissues in addition to that definitely we we can understand that increase in temperature whenever we do uh, physical activity there is increase in our body temperature and that also facilitates the hemoglobin to deliver more and more oxygen to the tissues in addition to that we also produce an intermediate product of metabolite that is 2,3-diphosphoglycerate that is produced in the RBC and that also compels the hemoglobin to shift. Uh, I mean, uh, that also compels the hemoglobin to deliver more oxygen to the tissues, which is actually good for the tissues. Shifting the curve to the right hand side, this was the normal one. And when we do strenuous activity and exercise, this curve, you can see it has shift to the right hand side, right? What was the reason for that? Reason for that was decrease in pH, increase in 2,3 dpg, increase temperature and increase in the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. 
So now when this curve shift to the left hand side, naturally hemoglobin, you know, becomes a great associator with oxygen. It does not like to dissociate, uh, you know, it is a poor donor uh, of hemoglobin, I mean of oxygen, when the hemoglobin, uh, the, uh, oxygen dissociation, dissociation curve moves towards the left hand side. And all the factors that were prevalent in right hand side, when you reverse those factors, that is increase in pH, decrease in uh, 2, 3 uh, diphosphoglycerate, decrease in temperature, this will force the hemoglobin to be a more good associator of oxygen, thereby giving less oxygen to the tissues, right? So this is all about uh, oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and how oxygen has been transported. Now, once we are done with oxygen, we have the most important carbon dioxide, how that has been cleared off, we all also have to know. Similarly, uh, like that of carb uh, oxygen, Carbon dioxide is also physically dissolved in the plasma. It is about 10% of the total carbon dioxide. It is physically dissolved in the plasma. And also, you know, what is at the amount? Amount is around 2.5 ml of carbon dioxide plus 100, per 100 ml of blood, right? In addition to that, 10% is also, uh, you know, uh, 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 transported via the carbamino compounds. What are carbamino compounds? These are the compounds which are actually, you have heard about hemoglobin, the globin chains, they have got the amino group as since it is it is a protein in nature. So these amino groups can accommodate carbon dioxide during the process. And once they are inside the lungs, they can reverse the release of this carbon dioxide. And nearly 10% uh, of the total carbon dioxide is carried in this way, which is called the carbamino compound. And the major chunk of uh, you know, uh, carbon dioxide that is being carried, which is about nearly 90%, that is through or that is via the bicarbonate form. Then how bicarbonate is formed, the question arise. Question is that uh, when you mix carbon dioxide with water, then under the action of a specific enzyme that is called carbonic anhydrase, the, there is a formation of uh, carbonic acid and carbonic acid uh, readily dissociate into H plus and HCO3 minor right so when we are at tissue level when uh, when the plasma is collecting carbon dioxide in those situation the process or the chemical reaction will move towards the right hand side right hand side means from carbon dioxide to bicarbonate similarly when this bicarbonate will be loaded along and taken along uh, the circulation into the level of lungs the opposite reaction will occur that is the bicarbonate will now uh, bind with the hydrogen ion that is present within the RBC and it will form uh, carbonic acid and this carbonic acid will then again dissociate into carbon dioxide and water resulting in carbon dioxide being expelled out of the lungs and water also to some extent will puff out water also. So it is very important to understand that this is the basis how carbon dioxide is being transported in the blood. I mean uh, in your system, in our system, right hand side of the reaction will happen at the level of tissues left hand side or the you know uh, left uh, this reaction will proceed left hand side when we are or when the rbcs are at the level of lungs right so this is the pictorial diagram you can see here at the level of alveoli what we are doing we are unloading a lot of oxygen and uh, uh, you know uh, what happens is loading of oxygen happens i'm sorry loading of oxygen happens at the level of alveoli through oxyhemoglobin and definitely there is unloading of carbon dioxide and this process happens and carbon dioxide and water is being released so this is at the level of alveoli or lungs now the same uh, situation happens at the level of tissues you can see here the carbon dioxide is being loaded and unloading of oxygen has been done because tissues are in need of a constant supply of oxygen so oxygen will be unloaded from the rbcs to the tissue so loading and the just the opposite thing happens at the level of lungs and at the level of tissues so this is the basic diagram for that so this is the summary of respiration you see that uh, you know uh, we have the external environment which is high in oxygen and low in carbon dioxide generally uh, you know since our upper respiratory tract has a, a very uh, close contact with the with the external environment so definitely our alveoli is rich in oxygen so there, what happens is that loading of oxygen to the RBC and unloading of carbon dioxide happens, takes place. And via the circulation, permanently veins and via the aorta, it reaches the tissues. And in the tissues, the opposite thing happens, that is unloading of oxygen and loading of carbon dioxide, which results in, you know, uh, transportation of this high carbon dioxide via the right side of the heart into the lungs again. And in the lungs, unloading of carbon dioxide and loading of oxygen takes place. So this process continues. 
and uh, you know this is called the respiratory cycle so this is what we have understood just now and uh, via the processes of all those things respiration and exchange of gases is happening okay having said that this is the last part of our uh, topic we have a higher centers involvement in the respiration that is neural regulation of respiration also because the activity of the respiratory muscles is transmitted into the veins via the different nerves which has phrenic nerve and intercostal nerves and there are different designated neural centers in the brain which are at the level of pons and medulla the pons appears to smooth out respiratory rate because whenever there is uh, you know a change or uh, uh, in in the concentration of oxygen or carbon dioxide the higher centers are being you know uh, they are being alerted and the higher centers uh, gives motor signals and because of that we we do form a change in the respiratory cycle and that results in uh, the normalization or restoration of homeostasis so what is the normal respiratory rate it is eupnea it is about 12 to 15 cycles per minute and hyperapnea is a term which is called or uh, which is uh, said when there is increased respiratory rate often due to extra oxygen need for example whenever we are doing some exercise or whatever we are doing some physical activity so now this is the pictorial diagram where you will find that how the neural regulation of respiration happens there are some uh, sensors which are present at the aortic arch which these are called you know chemoreceptors these chemoreceptors they can sense uh, you know uh, a change in the oxygen concentration and there are other sensors which can uh, sense an increase in carbon dioxide concentration directly into the blood because they sense the blood and even if there is a slight change they can be activated and once they're activated possibly via the uh, nine cranial nerve that is hypoglossal nerve that are uh, they are uh, alarming the you know higher centers of the brain of respiratory centers which are present at the pons and medulla when they are alerted when they are stimulated then uh, you know they do respond uh, or they do send their motor signal to the intercostal muscles via the intercostal nerves and to the diaphragm via the phrenic nerves where they give the motor response to contract and more contraction leads to increase in the respiratory increase in rate and depth of respiratory rate and thereby as i said restoration of the homeostasis right now there are some factors which uh, influence the respiratory rate and depth there are some physical factors which are increase in body temperature definitely happens when you do exercise or you know when we have fever or something like that there is increase in respiration rate and depth when you do exercise as i said in terms of talking in terms of coughing also there is a change in respiratory factor these are physical factors consciously uh, also we can control respiratory rate up to a certain extent that is called volition and there are also psychological and emotional states where a lot of change we can see in the respiratory rate and depth right there are some chemical factors as i said these are uh, the change in the carbon dioxide levels the carbon dioxide level in the blood is an essential you know, factor which is the main regulatory chemical for respiration the increased carbon dioxide increases respiration or decreased carbon dioxide decreases respiration is vice versa changes in carbon dioxide acts directly at the level of medulla the higher centers of the brain as we say not only that chemical factors the oxygen levels are also very important indicators for regulating the rate and depth of respiration they can also be sensed by some chemoreceptors that are present in the aortic arch and the information is sent into the medulla oblongata that is the higher centers of the brain and uh, 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 so and so vice versa these things can happen and lastly there are some aging effects also which happens uh, or which tend to uh, you know uh, have a influence on respiratory system as we age the elasticity of the lungs decreases that is very obvious the lung volumes and capacity also decreases that will be more uh, you know taken over by my co speaker after my lecture uh, oxygen carrying capacity also decreases simulating effect of carbon dioxide eventually and proportionally decrease as you age further and moreover we have uh, more risk of respiratory tract infection so these are all the factors which can lead to you know as we age these factors can come hand to hand and because of that there will be some detrimental change in the respiratory system and and by doing proper activity and proper exercise we can delay all those effects so thank you so much uh, this was in short which i felt you know would be uh, much more uh, you know uh, uh, interesting to all of you uh, uh, i my introduction has already been given to you and i have given here my email i am also available in linkedin and also i have my uh, instagram profile so any questions is most welcome and since the time is limited here so if all of you does not uh, get your chance to question me directly you can definitely write to me anytime anywhere and i will definitely respond to you right
And this is the campus of my National Sports University. Uh, it is a central government institute, the first of its kind in India. It's a PM vision. And definitely, uh, we are running uh, different courses. And sports physiology course is uh, initiated to run in from the next academic year. So uh, since you are undergraduate students, I urge you to have a look at the website. And if you are interested, then you can uh, look for your career in sports physiology and sports sciences. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chakraborty, for such an lucid and uh, you have presented the physiology of respiration in such a lucid manner. And I hope the students would be very helpful uh, viewing and hearing your presentation. And uh, any questions? I don't uh, find any questions yet in the chat box. So I think uh, all the uh, listeners in the YouTube or in the stream yard will be posting you the questions. Thanks once again. And uh, wish you a very excellent uh, uh, year ahead with your project. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So in the we have just completed our sec first presentation of uh, today's lecture series. And now we are on to the second lecture of today's online lecture series. And it would be the second lecture series would be presented by Dr. Ishita Shaha. And uh, a warm welcome, Dr. Ishita Shaha. And Thank you, ma'am. The topic uh, today is, uh, and she would, Dr. Shaha would be speaking on chest and lung function techniques. And uh, to give a very brief uh, introduction of Dr. Ishita Shaha, that she has done her MBBS from Arjikor Medical College, and then she has done her post-graduation in physiology, MD in physiology from Medical College, Kolkata. And currently, she is an assistant professor in Kol uh, Medical College, Kolkata, Department of Physiology. And by in his, uh, she is a very young uh, faculty at the Medical College Kolkata, where she is teaching physiology. And uh, she by this time she has already had many papers to her credit in both national and international journals. She is also she is acting as a principal investigator of the of a WBDST funded. Uh, project and at the same time she is pursuing a PhD uh, at uh, Calcutta University Department of Physiology and uh, I think uh, you'll be enjoying her presentation on chest and lung function techniques so over to you Dr. Shaha for your presentation. Thank, thank you ma'am for this nice introduction and at first, I wish to convey my thanks to PSI Education Committee for offering me this platform to present in front of such esteemed audience. And my topic today is chest and lung function techniques. I'm trying to share my screen. Ma'am, am I visible? Yes, uh, your presentation is visible. Okay, and you are also visible. OK, OK, thank you. Uh, thanks to first, thanks to Dr. Chakraborty for such an informative presentation and for introducing our audience to re uh, respiration and its physiological aspects. Chest and lung function techniques are important investigations, not only in management of respiratory diseases, but also in assessment of normal functioning of lungs and chest wall. Chest and lung function tests are actually indicated in patients coming with respiratory symptoms and signs like 
cough, shortness of breath, wheezing or crackling sound uh, on chest auscultation. In, uh, for investigating and monitoring patients with diseases having respiratory complications like connective tissue diseases and neuromuscular disorders. Monitoring patients with chronic pulmonary diseases and their prognosis like bronchial asthma, COPD, pulmonary vascular diseases and interstitial lung diseases. For monitoring people who might have occupational exposures to coal, silica, asbestos, or uh, ionizing radiation. And last but not the least, for preoperative evaluation and postoperative monitoring of patients following lung, res lung resection, cardiothoracic and abdominal surgery, transplant recipients, and so on. Performing chest and lung function tests are generally safe. But there are some facts that we should consider beforehand. Some of these tests are effort dependent. So patients understanding and cooperation in performing the test is important for getting us to a desired result. Second is the measured values of different respiratory parameters are compared with predicted normal values obtained from large population studies of age, sex, height, and ethnicity matched healthy individuals. Effort dependent maneuvers should be performed at least three times to check for reproducibility of the result. And uh, the variation in readings in each step should not be more than 200 ml. Preferably, the test should be performed in sitting posture to avoid syncopal episodes and patient injury. And of course, there are some advices for the patients like not to smoke at least one hour before testing, not to have large meal prior to testing, not to wear tight clothing during the test, as all these might affect the test results adversely. In chest and lung function tests, dynamic studies are performed at first. They include spirometry and recording of flow volume curve and bronchodilator challenge test. This is then followed by testing lung volumes and capacities. And finally, the diffusion, capa diffusion capacity of lungs are tested. Spirometry is the most frequently prescribed pulmonary function test. It is done by an electronic spirometer. The patient here is asked to make maximum breathing effort with a maximum inspiration followed by a forceful expiration for as long and as quickly as possible. Spirometry actually measures the volume of air moving in and out of the lungs during various breathing maneuvers, such as tidal breathing or normal breathing, deep breathing, and a force vital capacity maneuver. As a result, a volume time spirogram is recorded. The most important values that we get from a volume time spirogram are FEV1, also known as forced expiratory volume in one second, the FVC or forced vital capacity, and the ratio of the two, that is FEV1 by FVC. The spirometry and the calculation of FEV1 by FVC allow in identification of obstructive and restrictive pulmonary diseases and differentiating them. Normal value of FEV1 by FVC should be more than 80%. That means uh, a normal person should expel more than 80% of FVC at the end of one second of expiration. When FEV1 and FVC ratio is less than 70%, when it is less than 70%, this indicates an obstructive ventilatory defect. Common examples being bronchial asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, etc. As reduction in FEV1 here is more than FVC reduction, here FEV1 reduction is more than FVC reduction, the morphology of the pulmonary volume time curve is altered. So the morphology of pulmonary volume time curve is altered in obstructive lung disease as compared to the healthy lung.
Now, if FEV1 is expressed as a percentage of its predictive value, it also provides an assessment of severity of airflow obstruction. Now, let's see if more than 80% of predictive value of FEV1 is there, it indicates mild obstruction of the small airways. Whereas in, case of, uh, uh, in cases where FEV1 is less than 50% of its predictive value, severe to very severe small airway obstruction is suspected. Now coming to another case where FEV1 by FVC ratio is more than 70%. This indicates a restrictive lung disease. Examples are pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial lung disease, or maybe chest wall deformity. Moreover, the morphology of the pulmonary volume time curve is preserved here in restrictive lung disease because of proportionate reduction in both FEV1 and FVC. Now, the electronic spirometer also produces a pulmonary flow volume loop with a positive expiratory limb and a negative inspiratory limb. And the area that is circumscribed by the loop indicates the total lung capacity. This loop also provides us with the information regarding the maximum flow rate during expiration. And it is known as peak expiratory flow rate or PEFR. The flow volume curve also provides maximal flow rates between 25% to 75% of the forced vital capacity. So with the backdrop of the expected appearance of the flow volume curve, important information can be uh, obtained if curve morphology is altered. Like in this scenario, in patients with obstructive lung disease, there is reduction in expiratory flow. So in obstructive lung disease, there is reduction in expiratory flow in peripheral airways. But the, what uh, this will impart, this will impart a concave appearance to the descending portion of the expiratory limb. It will impart a concave appearance to the descending portion of the expiratory limb rather than it being a straight line as it occurs in case of a healthy person. However, in presence of a normal flow volume curve, a reduced PEFR, that is a reduced peak expiratory flow rate value, can also indicate early airway obstruction in asthma patients. But one thing we should remember that although PEFR is reduced, the morphology of the pulmonary flow volume curve is still normal. So Reduction in PEFR is an early sign of airway obstruction in case of asthma patients. Moreover, uh, the um, uh, value of FEF 25% to 75%, that is the forced expiratory flow rate, 25% to 75% value is also important because it provides a reliable picture, even uh, to be precise, a more reliable picture of overall asthma control. And it is also helpful in monitoring response to therapies provided. Now coming to how the flow volume curve changes in restrictive lung diseases. In restrictive lung diseases, the expiratory limb is convex or linear in appearance because the flow rates are preserved here. The only problem lies in that there is reduction in the lung volumes. So the total lung capacity actually reduces, but the uh, expiratory limb either stays convex or either maintains its linear appearance. Now, in connection to this, uh, one test needs mentioning that is the bronchodilator challenge test. This is done in case of patients where asthma is within control and the spirometry is also appearing normal. Here the patient is nebulized with 2.5 milligram of salbutamol and the spirometry is repeated. More than 12% increase or more than 200 ml increase in FEV1 and FVC is an indicator that the person will be benefited from a bronchodilator therapy like inhalation salbu in inhale salbutamol or inhalation steroid. And one thing we should remember that even if the, this test result 
is negative. It does not mean that the person will not be benefited from a bronchodilated therapy. Next coming to what breathing reserve is and what is dyspneic index. Breathing reserve is the maximum amount of air that can be breathed in or breathed out of the lungs above minute ventilation. Minute ventilation is nothing but uh, the product of tidal volume with the respiratory rate. Now, breathing reserve is measured by deducting minute ventilation from maximum voluntary ventilation and normal breathing reserve is 115 to 160 liter. Now, the percentage ratio of breathing reserve and uh, maximum voluntary ventilation is represented as dyspneic index. Normal value of dyspneic index is 90%, but if the value is less than 60%, the patient will have breathlessness even at rest. So, breathing reserve and dyspneic index both are clinically very significant. Coming to measurement of residual volume and total lung capacity. Both of them cannot be measured by spirometry. Residual volume and total lung capacity are therefore measured by tests where the patient breathes an inert gas mixture such as helium. The concentration of helium is then measured in the expired gas and from there residual volume is calculated. Or another method is sometimes uh, followed in that the patient sits in an airtight booth in which pressure change is uh, measured as he or she breathes. And the name of that technique is whole body plethysmography. Now, residual, residual volume is important because it gives idea about air trapping and hyperinflation in obstructive diseases. On the other hand, reduction of total lung capacity is helpful in assessment of the degree of true restriction in case of restrictive lung disease or where there is a mixture of obstructive and restrictive diseases. Coming to the measurement of diffusing capacity of the lungs for carbon monoxide. This test is important because it is a measurement of diffusion capacity of lungs uh, uh, and it provides information about integrity and the surface area of viable respiratory membrane. That means the surface area of respiratory membrane that is available from where gaseous exchange is possible. For this, 0.3% carbon monoxide gas mixture is inhaled by the patient, which is easily soluble in blood and binds to hemoglobin with great affinity. Its alveolar uptake is limited only by one factor, that is diffusion. Now, calculation is done by Comparing the inspiratory and expired fraction of carbon monoxide. When DLC of value is between 75% to 140% of its predictive value, it is considered to be normal. But if DLC of value falls down or falls below 60% of its lower limit of normal, this indicates reduction in viable respiratory membrane as seen in case of anemia, emphysema, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary fibrosis, etc. Coming to arterial blood gas analysis. Arterial blood gas analysis is important test for assessment for tissue oxygenation. That means how oxygen is being, how much oxygen is being transported through the, uh, through the blood and how much um, uh, oxygen is being delivered to the tissues those informations can be collected by arterial blood gas analysis. We actually measure the pH of blood, partial pressure of carbon dioxide, partial pressure of oxygen, bicarbonate concentration, oxygen saturation in this process. And in arterial blood gas analysis, if we find that partial pressure of oxygen is low with normal partial pressure of carbon dioxide, Type 1 respiratory failure is suspected and type 1 respiratory failure is usually seen in case of pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, etc. And if in arterial blood gas analysis, hypoxia is accompanied with hypercapnia, that means there is low partial pressure of oxygen along with low partial pressure of carbon dioxide, 
We suspect the type 2 respiratory failure, which is usually seen in case of severe weakness of respiratory muscles or complicated cases of uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. Now, here are some other tests, uh, chest and lung function tests that are tabulated. These tests are not done on a routine basis, but they are prescribed if specific abnormalities are suspected on clinical evaluation of the patients. First comes the respiratory muscle, muscle function test for uh, inspiratory and expiratory mouth pressure. These tests are indicated in guillain bear syndrome, uh, muscular dystrophy, myasthenia gravis, where we suspect that the maximum inspiratory pressure may be reduced. A normal maximum inspiratory pressure should be more than 100 centimeter of water. But when it is less than 80 centimeter of water, the patient is considered for mechanical ventilation to avoid respiratory failure. Another uh, such test is overnight oximetry test. In overnight oximetry test, uh, we generally prescribe this test to patients who are having excessive daytime sleepiness. And uh, 10 episodes of less than 4% oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. 10 episodes of less than 4% oxygen saturation of hemoglobin, hemoglobin in one night is diagnostic of obstructive sleep apnea. Third comes the cardiopulmonary exercise testing. This is done to check for lung ventilation as well as oxygen consumption by heart. If oxygen consumption is less than 80% of its predictive value, the patient is diagnosed to have reduced oxygen tolerance, so, sorry, reduced exercise tolerance. So these are some tests that are uh, prescribed in specific situation to specific patients. If we suspect uh, ventilatory or other type of uh, respiratory abnormality. Mm, now coming to the situations where we will not prescribe chest and lung function tests. These tests are not prescribed in general. In, there are also some contraindications to chest and lung function tests. So what, what are those? It is not prescribed in myocardial infarction in patients with myocardial infarction within one month and if the person has got history of unstable angina, if the patient is suffering from recent pneumo pneumothorax, if there is recent, uh, thor there is episode of uh, thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm, if the patient has underwent recent thoracoabdominal surgery or ophthalmic surgery. Infectious respiratory diseases like pneumonia and tuberculosis are also relative contraindications of the chest and lung function test. That means in those conditions, we can prescribe the test, but after taking very specific precautions. Here I have got a, a, a memory map for systematic interpretation of the test results for differential diagnosis of different ventilatory disorders of lung following spirometry. First, we will check for FEV1 by FVC ratio. Now, if it is not reduced, then the person either is normal or is suffering from restrictive disorders. Now, we will have to know what is the value of FVC. A reduced FVC value, a reduced FVC value will now confirm the presence of restrictive pattern of ventilatory disorder and a normal FVC will rule out any ventilatory disorder. Now, depending on whether we know the total lung capacity or not, the severity of the restriction can be assessed. How can it be assessed? The C if we do not know the total lung capacity, the severity of the restriction can be assessed by using FVC as a percentage of the predictive value. And if we uh, know the total lung capacity, we can actually uh, know that we can actually assess the uh, uh, severity of restriction by um, using TLC or the total lung capacity as a percentage of its predictive value. Now, again, we go back to the top and look at the FEV1 by FVC ratio, where FEV1 by FVC ratio is reduced. Then 
we can uh, confirm that there is an obstructive type of ventilatory defect. Now coming to the value of FVC. Now if FVC value is normal, then there is pure obstruction. If FVC value is normal, there is purely obstructive disease. But if FVC value is reduced, then we should know about or we must know about the total lung capacity. Now in absence of the information about total lung capacity, there is a possibility of mixed obstruction and restriction of the ventilation. But if we know the lung capacity and if it is, uh, if it is reduced, uh, uh, then there is mixed obstruction and restriction. And if it is not, if it is uh, not reduced, if it is normal, then there is uh, the person is having a purely obstructive disease with a pseudo restriction. That means the restriction there is uh, actually not true. Rather, some airs are being trapped due, because of having purely obstructive disease, and those trapped areas of the the areas of the alveolar where the air is being trapped, they are not actually participating in ventilation in the subsequent cycle. So that is how in a systematic approach, we can actually uh, recognize the pattern of the disease and classify their severity. And with this, I have actually reached the uh, end of my chapter. But before I conclude, I just want to emphasize on one fact that recognition of pattern of the respiratory pathology corroborated with patient history and the clinical findings that we obtain from the examinations can always lead to proper diagnosis of the disease and judi judicial disease management. Uh, thank you. Thanks to the audience for the patience. Hey, thank you, Dr. Shaha for such a wonderful presentation on the different lung function techniques and maneuvering on the clinical manifestations of the respira different respiratory disorders. And uh, next, uh, we would uh, like to just uh, go on to Dr. Proshun Priyonayak to give us the vote of thanks for today's online lecture series. Dr. Nai, please. Good evening, everyone. I wish to thank Dr. Uh, Arijit and Dr. Isita for such lucid presentation of uh, complicated topic. Both the lectures were very good. However, uh, I think we finished a little early today. I hope uh, students uh, may enjoy these uh, brief presentations. Overall, Dr. Arijit has given us a beautiful introduction about the respiratory system and how it works. And then with his backgrounds with physiology and his uh, expertise in sports physiology, we could understand how the respiratory system can work in physiology, particularly with rest and demands, physiological loads, physiological demands. Then in continuation with that, Dr. Isita explained the concepts, evaluation, measurements could be useful in physiological as well as pathological conditions. I express my sincere thanks 
to both the speakers for their valuable time their expertise and their involvement in this activity i also wish to convey my sincere thanks to the whole team of psi education committee especially dr sompa to host being in front of camera and dr binoy to manage the technical parts with his expertise being behind the camera and other members of the education committee who were being a continuous support to hold these sessions effectively i also will be thankful to all the teachers who are encouraging us all the students who are supporting and uh, dr sabita jograj has nicely mentioned that both the presenter and presentation so are crisp and informative that's what i was uh, suggesting for the students it will be very useful to brush up quickly about the respiratory system just to before uh, exam or before uh, completion they can have a quick brush up with these topics thank you dr jograj so i wish to also convey sincere thanks to the physiological society of india and its office bearers executive committee to hold and continue this lecture series here i would like to mention that our next session of this lecture series will be on 29th 28th of october saturday 7 of uh, 4th saturday as usual 28th of october 7 pm and this time we are planning to have sessions on excretory system i hope those who are following us those who are uh, following this series they will love to join and uh, give us feedback how we can improve further and how useful these sessions are thank you everyone once and all for joining with us and wish you a happy learning sessions ahead thank you all